I'm the mother of two young daughters, and I'd like to invite you into my world for just a second. She's really feeling it. <laughs> See, everybody knows that parenting and crying go hand in hand. Tantrums are part of the deal. We also know that crying is good for us. We've known this for 2,000 years. Aristotle even wrote about it. And yet, on a daily basis, our actions and our language completely contradict this. You know the baby dance? Oh, hush, 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 don't cry. We do it with our toddlers. Oh, you're okay, don't cry. Shake it off. We do it with our teens. Honestly, I don't even know what the big deal is. Why are you crying? And we do it with ourselves. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't even know why I'm crying. We act as if we are ashamed of our feelings. We've somehow gotten the message that courage Courage comes with avoiding, but courage never comes with avoiding. Courage comes with action. Our soldiers have a saying, they say, embrace the suck. I think this works pretty well for parenting, too. You find yourself in a situation. It's not going to change. Put your arms around it. And sometimes, like in the grocery store, where I pressed record on my daughter, that you just heard. <laughs> it does just suck. It's no fun. But an acceptance, an acknowledgement, that gives you power. Well, there's one thing Embrace the Suck forgets, and it doesn't tell you. It is scary, because you come face to face with your vulnerability. Tina Fey has a saying. She says, some say, never let him see you cry. I say, if you're so mad you could just cry, well then cry. It terrifies everybody. <laughs> and it does. Brene Brown, a social worker and an American scholar, has written a number of books on vulnerability and given a few TED Talks. She says vulnerability, it looks like truth and it feels like courage. Truth and courage are uncomfortable but they are never weakness. And we equate tears with weakness all the time. I want you to picture a man crying in public. Now some men have, because they honestly and truly believe it. But you men in the audience, I want to ask you this. Picture yourself crying in public. And what does your inner critic maybe even whisper to you? I'm guessing sissy. Now women, we have it a lot easier. They did a study and found that women cry five times more in a month than a man. And I'd believe this. My husband, he would definitely believe this. But I want you to picture this. A woman is crying and she's going on and on. And you start thinking, is she doing this to get what she wants? And the word that comes up is manipulative, right? We even have a word for this for our little guys. We say crocodile tears, as if their tears can make us do something that we don't choose to do. There's so much judgment around crying. And yet, our reaction, our response, and our interpretation, that's on us. I want to tell you about when my daughter was born. That's her. When she came out, she let out a wallop of a yell. And she was crying, and I was crying as they put her on my chest, and my husband was crying. And I look across the room, and here's the doctor. And she's just watching us. And it occurs to me that she is listening for my child's cry, because in that, it tells her something. Healthy lungs, breathing baby. See, tears, they communicate. And we forget that. The chemical makeup of tears contains stress hormones and endorphins, so your body knows what it's doing when it's crying. It says, 
I can't hold on to all this stress. I got to get it out, but that's pretty painful. So I'm going to give you a shot of endorphins to ease the pain a little bit. And also make way for a little happiness, feeling of well-being. See, the road to happiness can literally be paved by our tears, and we stifle them repeatedly. Our bodies know what it's doing when it's crying. No one teaches us how to cry. She came out doing it. But we can teach our children and ourselves how to not cry. And we do that sometimes with love in our hearts and with the best of intentions. And we think, no, 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 we can't, we can't cry right now. Let's figure other ways around it. And unfortunately, our emotional tears, they will come out. Now, I want to tell you a story about Willem. That's not Willem. He was in preschool with my daughter. Cute little guy, big red curls, freckles, super sweet to play with, and still he started to bite. And that was no fun for anybody. So one day, the teacher had to bring him inside, and as she did, and she sat him down, she saw a wave of sadness cross over his face, and he hit the table, and he kicked it. She thought, hmm. So she said, Willem, let's get your sads out. It's what we say in school. It's a non-judgmental way to let the kids lean into their feelings, give them permission. And as she said this, his little body got tight and tense, and he balled up his hands, and he said, I am not a crier. Mary's a crier. You see, not two weeks before, his mom had told a story about when he took a tumble, and she said to a friend, oh, he fell down, but he didn't cry. No, he was great. Now, Mary, she's my crier, but Willem, nah, he didn't cry. And he heard her, and he believed her. So when it came time for him to cry, he thought, mm, I can't do that. So he bit, and he hit, and he kicked. Well, luckily for Willem, the teacher and the mom, they got together, and they convinced him that big boys do cry. And he found his tears, and he cried, and it took weeks. But he got to the end, and when he did, he stopped biting, and he stopped hitting, and he stopped kicking. Our emotional tears will find a way out. And we need to get to the end of it. Let them out. Now, the Mayo Clinic, they list one of the root causes of self-harm as a person's inability to understand, regulate, and express emotion. And adults, we do this thing. We have an intense emotion, and we think, I cannot let that out now. i got to sit on it. It's not, it's not safe. I'm going to let that out later. So we get used to stuffing it down. It's actually called executive functioning. This is our brains at work, and it works well. Our center for emotion and our center for reason, our prefrontal cortex, well, they can talk to each other pretty well because the neural pathways in between are well established. And so we think this is a great coping mechanism. I've got to teach my kid this. I've got to expect it of them. But when you look at your teenagers, Oh, they have intense powers of reasoning and pretty intense emotions. But the connectors in between, they're not fully formed yet. That doesn't happen until the mid-20s. And as for our toddlers, well, those little guys are just in the middle of developing all of it. And so when we try to reason them out of their emotions and say, use your words, let's talk this through, we might as well be saying, OK, enough sweating. I can't handle the sweating. Physiologically, it does not compute. They can't understand it. But we adults, we're really good at it because we can be. So we sit on those emotions and we stuff them, and then we release them later. Because we release them later, right? We get there, we find the safe spot. Well, see, we fall into those traps too. Sometimes it's just so scary to let them out we don't, and we hold on. And then it can become more preferable to be numb and to not feel than to feel our emotions. And that is when our distractions become our addictions. And I want to tell you one last story about that. My sister, she's a clinical neuropsychologist in Charlotte. She sees bright men and women every day that are convinced that they have Alzheimer's, and they're pretty scared. 
So she'll give them the memory test, and she'll diagnose them. And what she has found is this. Over 50% of the time, more than half of those men and women, they do have dementia, but their memory loss is due to a lifetime of stuffing their emotions. Our emotional tears, they will come out, but they just might not look like tears. A British psychiatrist once said, sorrow that has no vent in tears may make other organs weep. But then you're thinking, how do I do this? It's not like you can stop in the grocery store and say, all right, girls, let's go. Let's get it out. We're having the tantrum. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. But we can pay attention to our actions and our language. It looks like you've got some sads to get out. Let's get to the car and get them out, <laughs> right? With our teens, what's making you so sad? It's good to remember that anger is a secondary emotion. And even though we are more interested at this point and more able to express intense rage and get over that in this society, it's the second thing. Something comes first. So, find your release. Find your tears. Now, a good place to start is when you're in the middle of a tantrum, if you picture your kids just throwing up, it's a lot more, you can, you can call on your compassion easier because when your child is throwing up, you don't run right in there and throw up with them and you don't get upset for them for doing it. You say, no, let me rub your back, pull your hair back. Let's get that all out because you know once it all comes out, they'll feel better They'll sleep better, and they'll eat better. The same goes for crying. And if you find that that's really hard to do, because sometimes it actually is, and if you find that your child's cries, they're out of control, is met by you're out of control, and something you start to go at each other like that, because it happens. It's a pretty good indication that you've just been triggered Look in the mirror. How are you with your sads? Do you have some you need to get out? And if you find that you do, then find the end. Find a friend, tell them your story, and get them all out, because that's going to allow you to listen to somebody else's. That's painful and pretty scary. So find your release. In yoga, in 2012, Americans spent $10 billion on yoga, learning how to breathe, learning how to be present and at one in their bodies. This is where our children instinctively live, and we pull them out of it every single day, often to the point to where they cannot get back. We worry about teaching emotional intelligence in our schools. We fund studies on bullying, and we are appalled at some of the things our children are capable of. So clearly, we are concerned with their emotional intelligence. And yet, we shun the very expression of their emotions, their tears, and we shun our own. For how are we going to teach our children emotional intelligence if what we teach them is distract and deflect and disengage? How are we going to teach our children coping skills if we ourselves are so full up of our own tears we cannot even bear witness to theirs? Because that is when crying is cathartic. The Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology, they did a study. They wanted to know, is crying really cathartic? I mean, we believe this, but is it really true? They studied thousands of people over 30 countries, and what they found was this. Crying is cathartic when received by social support. So it's in how you receive someone else's tears, how you handle that, your judgment. That helps them to find the release. So do you remember 
1980s, Jane Fonda, feel the burn. <laughs> pain, it makes you stronger. Yes, it does. But pain makes you softer, more compassionate, more empathetic, and more emotionally intelligent. And that's the promise of parenting, is to teach our children to find comfort in themselves for who they already are. Now, I challenge you this. The next time you are faced with a crying fit, interrupt your instincts and think of the words of Maya Angelou. When the tears come, stop and say thank you. For when you can do this, your faith is strong and nothing can come against you. Stop, say thank you, and let the tears come. <laughs>